All right, this is Peter Gans. He's Chief of the Division of Cardiology and Director of the Center of Excellence in Vascular Research at San Francisco General Hospital and the University of California, San Francisco. So thank you. Good. Good morning. <laughs> I want to start by thanking Larry for inviting me. Uh, my title is actually different from the one that's printed in the brochure. And the reason is that when I was first invited, I didn't understand the spirit of the meeting, what the meeting was about. I thought it was the usual meeting where your group is basically focused on exactly what you do or something very closely related. And this is a much more interesting meeting than that. We hear about things we've never heard about before. So I thought it was appropriate to broaden the title of my talk and the title of my talk is Aging. And what's shown there are some Disney cartoons, or what stem cell biologists would call their data. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it shows a young mouse and an, and an old mouse. And really, Larry gave an introduction to my talk yesterday when he talked about the dilemma of aging and quality of life. And he had that curve A and curve B. The curve, one of these two curves is the typical curve where you get, you're getting older and the quality of life is diminishing until Byron Hewitt arrives and he makes everything better. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about one protein among the many proteins that, uh, that's, that Steve Williams talked about uh, that may relate to aging. And it's been a very interesting journey. Uh, as Steve said, we found about 200 proteins that relate to cardiovascular disease. And probably each one of these 200 proteins has a, has a story of its, of its own to tell. Uh, but the story that I'll be talking about is a particular protein called growth differentiation factor 11 and its relationship to aging. So the, I started by talking about mice, uh, but I'm a translational uh, phys uh, researcher, and what I try to do is take observations from basic biology and try to figure out how they apply to, to human beings. So this is just a reminder that at one point I was younger, and uh, I think I was meant to be a plant biologist, but since I moved to San Francisco, uh, people think I, I was probably meant to work for 1-800-Flowers. <laughs> and um, so that is part of the aging process that affects not just Larry, but the rest of us. So uh, I want to start about talking about aging of the cardiovascular system. And so this is just a cross-section of the heart. And just a reminder that the heart has four chambers, two ventricles, the, the pumping chambers, and two atria. And as part of the aging process, the ventricles thicken. And thickening has, has a medical term called hypertrophy. And typically, the left ventricle thickens as part of the aging process, uh, sometimes also the right ventricle. And the prevalence of left ventricle hypertrophy, thickening of the heart muscle, increases with age independently of, the, of blood pressure. So blood pressure can exacerbate it. But this is part of the aging process. And this left ventricular thickening or hypertrophy has some serious consequences. It's associated with uh, increased mortality, so you don't live as long. But it's associated also with quality of life issues. Uh, higher rates of heart attacks, that we call myocardial infarction. Higher rates of heart failure. And we divide heart failure into two general groups. The ones that occur because the heart is stiffer, that's called diastolic heart failure. And the heart failure that occurs because the heart isn't pumping very efficiently, that's called systolic heart failure. And this hypertrophied heart actually causes both types of heart failure. And also higher rates of strokes. So this aging process of the heart, uh, the thickening of the heart muscle has, has serious consequences. So if we understood the factors that cause cardiac hypertrophy with aging, could we then turn the clock back and make our hearts young again? 
could, could we, I'm sorry, could we take this old mouse, at least its heart, and could we turn this old mouse into a young mouse? Can we turn the clock back? So I wouldn't be giving this talk if there wasn't at least some answer. And the answer, or part of the answer, was provided by a fascinating paper that was a collaboration with SomaLogic from one of my former colleagues when I was at Harvard, at Harvard Medical School, Richard Lee. And was, the title of the paper was Growth Differentiation Factor 11 is a circulating factor that reverses age-related cardiac hypertrophy. So all of a sudden, uh, an intriguing title that they may have an answer. So they had a hypothesis, and that was that perhaps age-related cardiac hypertrophy is regulated by factors that circulate in blood. And their purpose uh, was to do an experiment where you take an old mouse and expose it to the circulation of a young mouse and see whether exposing the old mouse to a young mouse phenotype uh, through blood, whether exposure to young blood could, could actually reverse cardiac hypertrophy. And the, the approach that's taken is one that's now been published about quite extensively called parabiosis, uh, where you connect the circulation of two mice. You can choose mice of different ages to show that the young mouse can reverse the hypertrophy in the old mouse, but you also want to do all the right control studies where you also connect the circulation of two old mice or two young mice to make sure that any changes you're observing are truly related to age. So this is the data that was published by Richard Lee and his group. These are the parabiosis experiments. And just to go through them very briefly, these are the cross-sections of the heart. This is the left ventricle, the right ventricle. As you can see, the young mouse has a smaller heart uh, than the old mouse. So that's what we mean by age-related uh, cardiac hypertrophy. And when you connect the circulation of two old mice uh, for uh, about a month, and definition of an old mouse is it's 23 months old, you can see that it, hooking up to the circulation of two old mice really doesn't change anything. But if you connect an old mouse to a young mouse, and you look at the heart of the old mouse, it, its heart appears to be smaller. And if you then look at this uh, uh, for the overall cohort of, of mice, you can see uh, over 30 days, which is not a very long time, there's a significant reduction in a cardiac mass, so that the heart does get smaller. And more impressive is what happens to the si size of the individual cells within the heart, the cardiomyocytes. And as you can see, uh, the cardiomyocytes, this is female mice, male mice, the individual cells are larger in the old mice, and it, when they've been exposed to the young mice, uh, they return to, to a young phenotype. And not only do they return to the young phenotype in terms of, of their size, but they also return to the young phenotype in terms of their molecular structure. So these hypertrophied cells have some molecular signatures. One of them is that they have a relatively low level of a certain calcium handling protein called CERCA, and that relates to uh, cardiac stiffness. And it turns out that uh, Old mice have low levels of, of this protein that probably accounts for stiffening of the heart with age. And again, when the heart gets smaller, when it's exposed to the young blood, uh, the levels of this protein return to the youthful levels, as, as well as pro levels of many other proteins. So then the question, of course, is what, what was it that the young mouse was conferring to the old mouse through, through blood? And so Rich Lee and, and his colleagues did a, a screen. They did a metabolomic screen, a lipidomic screen. They really couldn't find any uh, analytes that differed significantly in their concentration between an old mouse and a young mouse. But when they did a proteomic screen, and this was in collaboration with SomaLogic, uh, they found about 13 proteins that are differential levels in blood, and these are listed here. 
And you can see one of these proteins, GDF11, uh, is present in much higher concentration than a young mouse uh, than it's present in old mouse. So it declines with age. And when they then tested all of these proteins in an in vitro system to see which of these proteins could inhibit myocyte hypertrophy in an in vitro system, they found that one of these proteins, GDF11, could inhibit cardiac hypertrophy in an experimental setting. So it then became the prime suspect for being the factor in blood that could turn an old heart into a young heart. So the next logical step was to uh, forget the parabiosis experiments, just take a recombinant GDF11, and uh, take an old mouse and treat it with GDF11 for uh, uh, about 30 days. And as you can see, there was significant reduction in the size of the heart, as well as molecular reprogramming. So GDF11 treatment for 30 days made the old heart a young heart again. So interestingly, when Rich submitted this to Cell, he called me up and he said, you know, they won't accept his article unless he can prove that it has human relevance. I was completely shocked. I've never heard a basic science article reject something because there's no human relevance. In fact, I think it's the other way. If it is human relevance, it's probably unimportant. <laughs> so Rich called me, and he knew that we had data in humans with somologic, with our colleagues in somologic, showing that basically something similar applies in humans, that low levels of GDF11, as Steve Williams showed you, converse, uh, co confers high cardiovascular risk. And so inclusion of these few sentences is apparently what allowed the article to be published, and I'm pleased that basic science is finally paying some attention to human translation. So this was what Steve showed you. This was one of the proteins that, whose low levels, meaning it's to the left of the unity line, confers high cardiovascular risk. So when the article was published, uh, it got a lot of press uh, from some of the top journals. Uh, New England Journal, it, even though this was published in Cell, New England Journal had an article about this uh, and it was in, under clinical implications of basic research. It was called Cardiac Aging and Rejuvenation, a Sense of Humors. And Nature Reviews had an article rejuvenating the aging heart. Uh, so it got a lot of uh, press from top scientific journals and also got press from even more important journals. And that's the British tabloid. <laughs> and so the, uh, the Daily Mail actually dis kind of discovered that maybe the vampires were onto something. And uh, this idea that, that Dracula, uh, in order to live forever, would try to get his GDF-11 kick from a uh, young woman in this case. Uh, you know, they were onto something, and, and the British tabloid press actually appropriately picked up on it. So uh, what is GDF-11? Well, GDF-11 is a member of the TGF-beta superfamily uh, of growth fa uh, differentiation factors. And it's a close homolog of GDF-8, also known as myostatin. And the reason I'd like to bring in the GDF-8 story is because many of you are familiar with it, probably more familiar than you may be with GDF-11. And you know the GDF-8, or myostatin, loss of function mutations are known to lead to skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And so this is uh, known among cattle that some of them turn out to be GDF-8 deficient, myostatin deficient. Uh, they are extremely muscular but also mutations among humans. So this is a four-year-old child uh, that has a loss of mutation in GDF8. And this poor child at the age of four look, looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, extremely muscular. So Rich Lee's hypothesis for mice and our hypothesis in humans is that perha perhaps GDF11 performs the same inhibitory function for cardiac muscle as GDF8 performs for skeletal muscle. And in humans, this is testable now, so we wanted to know, do low levels of GDF11 in humans 
uh, confer a greater risk of having cardiac hypertrophy, just like they would in mice. And we could do, go beyond mice because in the Rich Lee study, all they had is hypertrophy. In humans, we could ask, uh, do low levels of GDF11 not only confer left ventricular hypertrophy, but do they result in poor cardiovascular outcomes? Remember, LVH leads to heart failure and mortality and strokes and heart attacks. Could we actually observe those events in subjects who have low GDF11? So we can actually measure left ventricular hypertrophy, LVH, uh, using many tools. One of them is just uh, an echocardiogram, a cardiac ultrasound. You can see all four cardiac chambers. This is not a very sharp image, but you can actually quite precisely and accurately measure the thickness of the left ventricle to assess the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, which is carefully defined. Uh, and also, we have, we, can, we have a blood sample so that we can correlate with LVH, and we have a clinical follow-up so we can see whether a particular level of GDF11 is more prone to cause cardiovascular complications. And this was from the, the Heart and Soul study, the same study that Steve Williams talked about. And these were the questions. Uh, is there a relationship between GDF11 and left ventricular hypertrophy in, in humans? And is there an association between GDF11 and survival and quality of life is what Larry would call it, which is heart failure hospitalizations. So this is uh, our first data point here, which I'll explain. It's a little complicated, but basically shows the, the, the risk of having thickening of your heart muscle, left ventricular hypertrophy. And this is a quartile analysis. The Q4 means you're in the top 25% of your GDF11 concentrations, so you have high concentration of GDF11. Quartile one means you have low concentration of GDF11. So if you look at the highest versus the lowest quartile, you can reduce, if you're in the top quartile, you can reduce your risk of having LVH by about 50%. You can cut your risk in half. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a graded relationship. So this is really first human data. The GDF11 may do the same thing in humans as it may do in, in mice. But we have data that, the, that richly doesn't have, which is the relevance for cardiovascular outcomes. And you can see, again, a quartile analysis. The, the patients in quartile one have the lowest concentration of GDF11. These are, the quartile four is the highest concentration. You can look at heart failure hospitalization rates you can see the subjects with the lowest level of GDF11 have the highest rates of heart failure. Uh, they have highest rates of death. And these are pretty dramatic outcomes. So, and if we look at the relationship to age, it's a little bit difficult for us to do in this heart and soul cohort because unlike the, the mice studies that were published where you can look at the extremes of age, uh, two months old mouse versus a 23 months old, old mouse. In this particular cohort, the age was rather narrowly clustered. So the, the, the mean age was 67, and the standard deviation was about 10.8. So we really didn't have much of an age range. But despite that, if you look at the quartile concentration of GDF and how the age was represented in, in these, you can see uh, that the highest quartile had the youngest patients, 64.8 years on average, uh, and the lowest concentration was significantly older. So even within a narrow range of ages, we were able to discover a relationship between GDF11 level and age. Interestingly, it's the interplay with, with sex. And we know that this issue of cardiac hypertrophy with aging and its sequelae, including hospitalizations for heart failure, are more troublesome for women than they are for men. And we actually find that GDF11 levels are higher in men than they are in, in women potentially providing explanation why women get in more trouble. So that's aging, but in medicine, we also have more than aging. We have accelerated aging, people who age at a faster rate. And some of those conditions you're familiar with, Steve Williams talked about HIV, which is a big area of research in my hospital. Uh, patients with HIV now have relatively normal lifespans. 
because the infectious complications have been taken care of, uh, but they have very high rates of cardiovascular disease. Uh, their heart attacks occur at a much younger age, and our group is trying to figure out what causes accelerated aging and HIV. You have to do proteomics of that. But I won't be talking about HIV today, but I'll talk about another accelerated aging process, and that's chronic kidney disease, because we have more data on that. And just a reminder that when your kidneys begin to fail, uh, it's a huge risk factor for mortality and cardiovascular complications. And this is from a study from Kaiser uh, by Alan Goh, who's now one of our collaborators, and basically shows that as your kidneys fail, and this is a, a measure of kidneys that's called GFR, glomerular filtration rate, so it just tells you how effectively uh, the kidneys are filtering uh, substances. And fail failure of the kidney is basically going from left to right, so this GFR, normally you're born with a number around 120 or so, and by the time you get to less than 15, you're ready for dialysis. And you can see as your kidneys fail, you, you get this curvilinear relationship for mortality, for cardiovascular events, or any kind of hospitalization. So this has really profound uh, implications. And uh, these patients, who have chronic kidney disease develop the same problem as we see with aging in the general population. They develop left ventricular hypertrophy, thickening of the heart muscle. And when they develop thickening of the heart muscle, it carries poor prognosis again, just like in the general population. They simply have more of it. And so the question is, what causes thickening of the heart muscle in patients who have chronic kidney disease? And, you know, these are the, so these are the potential mechanisms derived from prior studies. Some of, it, some of the thickening of the heart muscle relates to the fact that the heart muscle has to work extra hard because of what is called volume overload, either due to anemia or simply the, the fluid overload is part of the chronic kidney disease process. Uh, chronic kidney disease is CKD. There's also pressure overload. The heart has to work extra hard because, because it has to pump against of increased pressure, either related to high blood pressure or related to this aging process in the vasculature of these patients. They tend to have vessels that are heavily calcified and their arteries tend to be very stiff, which puts an extra load on the heart muscle. And there also may be some metabolic factors that also may relate to cardiac hypertrophy. But our hypothesis is, is it possible uh, that as your kidneys begin to fail, that you develop accumulation of proteins that somehow inhibit the GDF11 pathway. And I really haven't said much about the GDF11 pathway. So we are wondering whether CKD inhibits GDF11 signaling. And this is what was published in the New England Journal, that, that article I showed you uh, about the GDF11 pathway. You guys know much more about this than I do. Uh, but this is apparently fairly typical TGF beta signaling. It's actually not clear whether SMADs are involved in, in, the, hyper, in the signaling that, that protects against hypertrophy, but the New England Journal Review article did put it in there. But what the New England Journal, Journal article didn't have, and what's usually not talked about, is that the pathway also has known inhibitors. And these are known as folistatin-like three protein, folistatin, GAPS-1, and GAPS-2. So we thought perhaps these inhibitors accumulate as your kidneys fail, because it's one of the functions of, of the kidneys is to clear proteins. So this is the collaboration, actually, that Steve talked about with the University of London in Malmo, where a lot of these proteins were measured with somalogic. I want to show you some data, but these are our questions. Are circulating levels of GDF11 and its inhibitors affected by CKD? And this, this is the cohort that it came from. So for GDF11, if you look at level of GDF11 on the y-axis, as a function of diminishing kidney function on the x-axis, so that normal kidney function is here, abnormal kidney function is there, there is no relationship. It's probably a good thing, because if GDF11 accumulated, it would be contrary to our hypothesis. Remember, GDF11 is protective against LVH. 
So if it accumulated, it would not be logical to what we are trying to hypothesize. But if you look at the inhibitors, so this is now the level of folistatin-like 3 protein, inhibitor of the GDF11 signaling. You can see that as your kidney function diminishes, that in a very predictable way, the inhibitor accumulates. And it's one of the four known inhibitors of GDF11 signaling. Three of them accumulate as your kidney function declines. Folistatin-like 3 protein, folistatin and GAS1. GAS2 doesn't change, and GDF11 doesn't change. So we now have a much more complicated story when it comes to left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, and it involves uh, an agonist, and it, it involves the consideration of its, of its inhibitors. So this study, I think, will continue because what we are still lacking is, is the measurements of left ventricular hypertrophy with ultrasound. So we are uh, in debate with, with a group that has the, the cohort, and it's very likely that we will end up working on this together. So before I finish, just two more slides. Uh, Larry talked about quality of life. And so far, I'm proposing that if this, if this GDF11 story evolves completely, we may hopefully turn this into some treatment. And so Larry will be able to sit in his home, and his heart will be pumping, and he won't have to go to the hospital because of heart issues. But he may be disappointed that you know, his cognitive function one day will decline, <laughs> and his skeletal, you know, starting from an IQ of 250, so it, you know, it may go to 230. And, um, his skeletal muscle will weaken and he'll be just, his quality of life will be awful. <laughs> so, Larry will be very glad to know, and of course he already knows, that three key papers were published 10 days ago in Science and Nature Medicine. And one of them, basically, this is again from Rach Lee's group, uh, that showed that you can reverse the skeletal muscle dysfunction that occurs with aging by administration of GDF11. And this is a heavily molecular study and talks about you know, skeletal muscle stem cells and how they are affected by GDF11. But the bottom line for quality of life is that if you take an old mouse and you test its endurance in some running test, and you treat it for 30 days with GDF11, you can almost double the, the running time. Uh, so at least you know that you'll be able to stand up from your sofa. But the question is, what's your cognitive function going to be? So that's the good news. Two more papers came out, basically showing that you can markedly improve the cognitive function in these mice, old mice, by giving them GDF11. And I unfortunately missed yesterday's talk about the hippocampus and, and the stress responses, but they actually looked at fear responses in these mice, which apparently somehow change as they get older. And they, look, they looked at spatial orientation in these old mice. Uh, kind of a typical test, and it turns out they all improved with GDF11 treatment. So you can actually turn the, an old brain into a younger brain. So, uh, so there's a lot that, about quality of life. So Lucy Shapiro yesterday talked about sexism, I think, in medicine, you, when you said take it all off, or it was... <laughs> So that said, you know, there are some differences between men and women. And one of them is that when I showed these data to my wife, who's a brilliant person, uh, much smarter than I am, uh, but she's a woman, she looked at me, her first question was, does it do anything for the skin? <laughs> 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 so I don't know the answer, because when I talk to Rich Lee, and when I, you know, we don't have patient data on skin, and he, you know, I don't know how you judge skin in mice, and 30 days may not be enough to change the skin. But I want to speak to, is Byron Hewitt here? Uh, Byron, so I know you guys will eventually have to make some money. And so, <laughs> proteomics is a good start, but if you want to get into skin products, <laughs> I would uh, explore this. <laughs> So this is really my, just my last, my finishing slide. So really, I, my career has focused much more on endothelial biology, but for the last five years, I had the extreme pleasure of working with somalogic on proteomics. And we've learned a lot of important lessons in patients.
one is that we now have much better models of cardiovascular risk prediction, as, as Steve said. And cardiovascular risk is how we treat patients. We treat low-risk patients differently from high-risk patients. So we need to have good risk prediction algorithms. And proteomics, I think, will change the landscape. It, will, it is the first successful personalized medicine approach. You know, genomics, at least the GWAS part of genomics, hasn't really been very helpful. This will be helpful. Uh, but also, we are learning about biologies and the aging process is just one protein. There are lots of other proteins. There will be lots of other lessons. And before I show my acknowledgement, acknowledgement slide, I also have to tell you, Larry, that you're ruining my marriage. And the reason is, this, this is so, ex in a good way, this is so exciting. People, say, people ask me, how do you know you're working on something exciting? And I tell them, you know, I live on a beautiful island outside of San Francisco called Belvedere, you know, with the views of San Francisco. And I'm married to the most wonderful person. And when we walk around the island almost daily, she periodically interrupts me and says, Peter, what did I just say? She knows I'm not listening to her. <laughs> and the reason I'm not listening to her is because I'm thinking about proteins. <laughs> so it's probably a good thing. So uh, I want to really emphasize this, that sometimes people show this in a perfunctory way, self-serving way, to say I'm a great person because you know, 50 people work in my lab and I attract the best collaborators. So these slides are often self-serving. In this case, actually, it's the opposite. This has really been a team effort involving Somalogic, uh, UCSF, and, and the Brigham. Uh, and most important, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, when we get together, there, you know, nothing beats getting together with our group and, and talking about these findings. So I started with Walt Disney, uh, and I'm going to end with Walt Disney. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I'm going to ask the first question, a guy question. What does it do for hair? <laughs> well, you know, Larry and I were wondering about that. Two things, hair color and hair amount. And I don't know the Well, answer. guys are interested in amount, I think. <laughs> All right, we have a few minutes for questions. We'll start on this side of the room. Either one of you two. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. Can you comment um, on the benefits of parapiosis in acute models of cardiac ischemia with regards to scar formation? Has that been done? Um, and what is the role of GDF11 and potentially other factors that will come into play as well? Uh, I'm sorry, so what would this do to healing of like myocardial infarction, for instance? So if you do acute models of uh, cardiac ischemia in the rodent, yes, and you apply parabiosis as one of the uh, potential parameters to prevent hypertrophy, to uh, work on scar formation. What are the benefits? And I assume GDF11 could be one of the factors. Yes. But I, there will be plenty others, is my yeah. guess. So if you're asking me, am I aware of a study that's looked at that? I'm actually not aware of a study that's looked at that. It's, it's a good question. I'm, I'm actually not aware of a, of a study that's been published on the topic. Yes. Let's go to the back of the room. Yes, way in the back, the gray. Excellent talk, thank you very much. You, you mentioned how GDF11 is a member of the TGF beta pathway. Right. And there are multiple drugs in development now against TGF beta, as you likely know, in cancer, in late stage development. And I was wondering if it's possible to look at the medical record data set and explore if there is a correlation between those drugs as a surrogate, of course, in a lowering, an improvement of cardiac function or a lowering of hypertrophy. So if you were giving a drug that inhibits GDF11 signaling, you would expect worse, you would expect worse outcomes. So the chart review would tell me, are these patients running into some difficulty, either from the cardiovascular standpoint uh, musculoskeletal standpoint or cognitive function standpoint. Uh, so if those drugs truly affect GDF11 signaling, it, it will be worth looking at. I, I, I thank you for the suggestion. Yes, over here. 
<laughs> uh, what should I tell people the side effects are likely to be? You know, I don't know. You know, anytime we have a growth, you know, anything that has growth differentiation factor, I want to make sure it doesn't have some side effects in terms of tissue growth that would be inappropriate. Uh, at this point, I don't know. These mice are not, after 30 days, there is no obvious detrimental phenotype. Um, we could look at GDF11 level in patients and see whether, aside from all the good things, we are hoping to look at whether there are some detrimental things. We, we haven't done that, so uh, it's a good reminder. We need to look for bad things as well as good things. Um, TGF beta family proteins as therapeutics has not been terribly successful over right. the years, BMPs and all of that. So I think people should not hold out hope that GDF11 will be there for them to reduce their aging anytime soon. Right. And I have to say, when it comes to GDF11, we've thought a little bit about GDF11 therapy, and you can really approach it in two ways. One of them would be replacement either with GDF11 or some analog, some active, you know, active, active site within a smaller molecule. But also you could work with the inhibitors. And it turns out the inhibitors are probably even, the, when we look at our outcomes by full statin like three protein levels in, in heart and soul, they are as impressive, if, if not more impressive than GDF11. So we may be able to manipulate the system more on the side of the inhibitors. One more question, right here. Uh, like athletes that have uh, uh, physiological hypertrophy? No, we, we want to look at that. So uh, I was offered, uh, you know, I, I always hate to ask Sumo Logic of more because they still need to be successful in their business model. It needs to be their focus. And I usually come with some science ideas. I don't want Byron to look at me. This is a crazy guy trying to destroy our company. Uh, <laughs> But there are these odd from, you know, these elderly people who run marathons, and they get together once a year, and uh, they arrive early because they are being studied. And they, give, they give blood samples. And I would actually like to know what GDF11 levels are in, in octogenarians who can run a marathon. I mean, you might even find some other proteins that, even though they hypertrophy, that are protective. So. Correct. So we don't want to overly focus, have tunnel vision on GDF11, and I think whatever we do in these blood samples would be a completely agnostic widescreen, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for a wonderful talk.